Hello and welcome! Most of the retro machines I prefer to tinker with are 486 and older. However, recently I needed a PC with an AGP port for some experiments. I had some parts and thought that this will be a quick ride. I didn't plan to make any videos about it, but I had so many issues to solve that I decided to make one eventually and share some of my experience with you. Most of the parts I used for this build were used in one of my simple servers many years ago. The used CPU was only 32-bit, and once I needed more memory and wanted to go for 64-bit, I replaced this server completely by another one. And all the years this hardware was resting half disassembled in a box. Let's go step by step through the hardware. This is the main reason why I do this video today. The main board, Asus K8V MX-S. It can be interesting for a retro machine build because you can find tons of them on eBay and other platforms. You can find exactly the one I used, but also many very similar models produced by different manufacturers. They are all very cheap and built around a VIA chipset. This mainboard is one of the latest AGP capable mainboards out there. It supports 8x AGP3, just what I needed for my experiments. The CPU socket is 754 and accepts AMD Athlon 64 and Sampron CPUs. The interesting technical thing about this mainboard is that it has kind of all features which were possible in the last days of AGP. Not only 8x AGP3, but also SATA 1, DDR400 memory, USB 2.0 and such things. Why kind of? Well, on the paper everything looks great, but in reality things are not quite as nice. There is this company named VIA, which made quite a lot of chipsets back in the days. They were usually stuffed with features to the top, but became very glorious due to many heavy bugs. One of the famous examples was the SATA 1 bug in the VIA VT8237 South Bridge, which supports only SATA 1 drives. Trying to connect a SATA 2 or faster devices, like a modern SSD for example, just doesn't work with this chip, despite that the SATA standard is actually backwards compatible. Well, this issue makes SATA ports on this mainboard basically unusable. I am going to use primarily an IDE hard and DVD drives in the system, however, I have a problem not being able to use SSD drives in this machine. You see, I'm Linux user since end of 90s. I'm not comfortable with Windows for various reasons, especially for hardware tests. I'm using this test SSD with Linux pre-installed on all of my machines. It is very simple to plug it into any PC and turn it on to see if everything works without having to mess around with drivers and such things. I want to use this computer as well for testing of various AGP and PCI cards I have, and it would be nice if I could just use the same testing software which I use everywhere. So, is there still any way to use a SSD drive in the system? Well, there is absolutely no way you can use the onboard SATA ports. But you can either use a PCI SATA adapter or a SATA to IDE adapter like this one. You can just connect your SSD into it and push the adapter into the IDE port. This main board is capable of doing ATA133, so the transfer speed will be limited to 133 megabytes per second, but it is still fast enough for this machine anyway. Okay, that's about the drive so far. Let's move on to the next part, the CPU. As I previously used this machine as a server, I had this AMD Mobile Sampron 3000 Plus running in it. Not many reasons why, I just had it back then. It uses slightly less power and remains cool. Both is nice to have in a server, which is running all the time. However, today I also have this AMD Sampron 2800 Plus and this AMD Athlon 64 3000 Plus. All of the CPUs have their pros and contras. As I told, I would like to be able to use my Linux test installation on this SSD, which is by the way 64-bit Arch Linux. So my first requirement on the CPU is that it has to support 64 bits. This means that the mobile Sampron is out, since it can only 32 bit. Two CPUs left. This Sampron and the Athlon 64 are almost the same. They both support 64 bit and have the same cache size. Sampron is slightly newer and supports SSE3 instructions, but Athlon 64 has 200 MHz higher frequency. I decided to go with Athlon 64. As for memory, I go with two DDR400 sticks of 512 MB each. One gigabyte should be enough for now, 
but if I need more I can upgrade it later to 2 GB. I am going to use the same case as what I used for the server. Obviously it used to be a home theater PC back in the days, but I bought this case already used and I have no idea who made these inscriptions. But it looks like it came already from factory. I don't like it, but it needs to be sanded and painted, so I never bothered to remove it yet. Anyway, the case is quite light and small. It has front USB and audio ports. As you can see, there is already a DVD drive inside, and let's take a look what else. It has a 450 watts ATX power supply. I don't trust that it really delivers 450 watts, but up to now it worked quite reliably. It has 24 pins ATX power connector, 4 pin 12 volt CPU power supply connector, 1 SATA power for Molex connectors and 2 floppy power connectors. As I already told, it has a DVD drive which is mounted to a rack, which is held by 3 screws in place and can be easily removed from the case. The rack provides space for a DVD drive, 2 2.5 inch drives and additional 3.5 inch drive underneath. This is another place for a 3.5 inch drive. So all in all, this case allows to use up to 4 hard drives. That explains why I use it as a server. Anyway, this 80GB IDE hard drive is what I'm going to use in this machine as well. Since it is going to be a retro build, I would like to have a floppy drive in this machine as well, just in case. If you look on the front, there are apparently two holes where you could theoretically place a floppy drive. However, inside you can see that one of the holes is blocked and there is no way to put anything in there. But the second hole has a cage for 3.5 inch floppy drive right there. Before putting the main board into the case, I always suggest to think about the cables. Especially IDE ribbon cables are always in the way and decrease airflow in the case, raising overall temperatures. It is possible to use such round IDE cables, but they still are hanging around and they are always in the way. So I prefer good old ribbon cables like this one, because they are flat and can be put between the main board and the case underneath. If you fold it in 90 degrees, you will get everywhere and will have a very clean setup. If the drives and IDE ports on the main board are far away from each other, you will need some longer IDE cables. One very helpful thing is that although an IDE cable has three connectors and the first one is often color coded to be the one which goes into the main board, it is absolutely irrelevant which one is which. They all are the same and dependent on the layout of your case, you can rotate the cable and take the longest part to get to your drives and the shortest one to the main board, just as I did in this case. Sometimes it is even more handy to put the middle connector into the main board, so don't think that the order is important. Also, it is simpler to connect all the front panel cables to the main board before you put it into the case. And as you can see, I put the floppy cable in the same way under the main board, so it is completely out of the way now. Two words about ATX power connectors. If you are new to your retro PC builds, you will probably be confused that more modern ATX power supplies have 24 pin power connectors, where the main boards back then used only 20 pin connectors. Well, this is not a big deal. The 24 pin connectors are fully 20 pin compatible. They are actually combined of two parts, 20 pin plus 4 pin connector, which can be separated if needed. So you can just push the first 20 pins into the main board ATX port and it will do the job. Unfortunately, there is not much I can do in this case to get the power cables out of the way. They are just too short to route them around the main board somehow. However, I used some zip ties to make it as good as possible. As you see, the Molex plugs are already in the drives. This SATA power cable can be used to connect the SSD if needed. As I told before, this case allows to put two 2.5 inch drives into this cage. This main board has a built-in S3 Unichrome Pro graphics adapter and it will be interesting to take a short look at it. However, I left one Molex connector hanging here near the AGP slot. This shall be used with this ATI Radeon X1650 graphics card. It is more or less period correct, maybe even a bit too new for this machine, but AMD Athlon 64 3000 Plus was released in the year 2003-2004 and was a mid-high-range CPU and X1650 was released one year later as low-mid-range GPU. So the balance between the CPU and GPU should be quite on point, without introducing obvious bottlenecks. There are, however, some problems with this card. 
First of all, the ball bearing is broken and the fan doesn't rotate properly anymore. It rotates jumpy and very loud, so I bought a bag of new ball bearings to exchange. Second issue is about all AGP cards, where PCI Express GPU was used with a bridge IC to convert the signals to AGP. All the X series Radeon cards are using such an AGP bridge. This X1650 is not an exclusion. The bridge is usually located on the back side of the PCB and the problem is that it gets extremely hot and is culprit number one when such a card fails. Unfortunately, and this will always remain a very strange decision for me, the manufacturers seldom put a heatsink on this IC. Just as often in the industry, it probably just should hold the guarantee and get broken after that. Anyway, I want this card to live longer, so I'll glue a heatsink on it. Unfortunately, I have to glue it because there are no holes around or any other way to mount some holders. Oh, and if you want to do it as well, please don't use normal glue get a tube of special heatsink plaster. The glue has to dry some time, but as I told, this main board has a S3 Unichrome Pro built-in graphics card, so time to get some software running. I installed 32-bit Windows XP Pro with Service Pack 3. As you see, from 1GB memory, 64MB were snatched by the onboard graphics. The desktop resolution will be 1024 by 768 at 32-bit for all of the tests today. The first test I would like to try today would be Doom 3, because I have it on a CD. The installation went properly, but this game unfortunately doesn't work on the S3 Unicron. As far as I know, you need a DirectX 9 capable graphics card for it, where Unicron is technically only DirectX 7. Ok, let's try 3D Mark 99. I have to admit that this benchmark runs pretty well on this integrated S3 Unicron. It ends up in almost 5900 points and runs surprisingly smooth. With 3D Mark 2001, the integrated graphics chip had already to struggle a lot. And tests were skipped because of missing DirectX 8 features, but at least it could finish the tests with 1873 points. Unreal was rendered properly and ran quite ok. However, I was kind of expecting that for a game from 1998. However, it was by far not perfect and was visibly struggling. This was confirmed in Quake 2 tests as well, with slightly over 31 FPS. These are more or less playable values, but not really good ones. Meanwhile, the heatsink plaster should have been dry and I could move on to the Radeon X1650. By the way, in Windows I use Snappy Drivers Installer, which I have on a USB stick to install all the drivers. First test will be Doom 3 again, and this time the game starts of course, on high settings with shadows, without anti-lacing at 1024 by 768 the time demo delivered 46 FPS. Not bad, not great, but playable value. In 3D Mark 99 the overall performance was at exactly 6000 points, which is almost the same result as what we got from S3 Unichrome. I'm not sure why, maybe due to some vSync issues? Please write into the comments what do you think about it. In 3D Mark 2001 now all the tests could be completed properly, since the X1650 supports everything up to DirectX 9. The result was quite impressive over the S3 Unichrome. I got almost 14,000 points, which is more than 7 times better result than what I got from the S3. In Quake 2 the system delivered 218 FPS, which was again about 7 times faster than what it was with S3 Unichrome. Ok, I'll come back to this benchmark later once again, but let's come back to the hardware issues. I ran some of the benchmarks and games on this machine, but I didn't say how I got all of the software in place. Well, this was something where I spent two days to figure out what is going on. I'm talking about the network. This main board has onboard via Rhin to 100 megabit network adapter and although all the drivers were installed properly and the system reported to have the network adapter up and running, I couldn't convince it to work. The network card failed to get an IP from DHCP server and if I set static IP, 
you just didn't receive any packets. I tried maybe 20 or 30 different wire drivers, both for the network adapter as well as for the chipset, but there was no way to get it running. Funny enough, when booting Linux from the SSD, everything just instantly worked out of the box. The network card got the IP and I could browse the internet without any issues. I made even some performance and stability tests and the wire run to just worked. I had no problems in Linux whatsoever. However, back to Windows, the network adapter refused to work completely. After two days of experimenting, installing and replacing drivers, trying different versions of Windows XP, I had to give up. I just don't know how to convince this network card to work in Windows XP. With another PCI network adapter, however, Windows also worked flawlessly, so I assume there is something wrong with the wire drivers. Well, this mainboard has only three PCI slots, and I will need at least two of them for aims which are out of the scope of this video. Furthermore, the Radeon X1650 gets quite warm, and I don't want to set any PCI cards in front of it and block the fan. However, after some searching in my spare parts box, I found this very low-profile Realtek network adapter. If I put it into the PCI slot in front of the graphics card, it sits so low that it almost doesn't block the fan in any way, so I guess it was a good compromise to go. I also deactivated the onboard via network card to save some hardware resources. If you know what is wrong with the via Ryan 2 under Windows XP, please enlighten me. I'm desperately curious about it. At least with the Realtek adapter, networking eventually just worked as expected. To get the data to the Windows XP Pro, I installed a FTP server, which is included there. To install it, just go to Control Panel, then Add Remove Programs, then Add Remove Windows Components, then double-click on Internet Information Services, and select File Transfer Protocol Service. The installation would probably ask for Windows XP CD to copy the required files from. After the installation, go to Control Panel again and select Administrative Tools. There you choose Internet Information Services. And here you have to open the folder tree on the left and go to Default FTP site, where you can set up all kinds of things, like access and security settings, but also home directory, which is actually the path which will be shared over FTP. If you want to copy files to Windows XP machine, don't forget to give write permissions. In my case, I set the shared folder to D slash FTP. And after you press OK, the FTP server should run. But you need to do one more thing. In Control Panel, Windows Firewall, you have to go to Advanced Settings and open FTP port 21. Or you will not be able to reach the machine due to firewall block. And here you go, now I'm on my Linux machine copying Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl, game over the network to my Windows XP machine. As you see, the transfer speed of around 10 megabytes a second corresponds to 100 megabits a second of the installed Realtek network adapter. And now I can copy anything I need to this Windows machine in a blink of an eye. And actually, I would call it a day. I got practically everything working, what I need, and I would come to the end, since this video is already long enough. But there was one thing I would like to show you in the end. This ASUS mainboard has an onboard Realtek sound chip. Back in the day, such onboard sound chips were heavily incoming, but they produced quite measurable performance impact on the CPU. I was wondering if I could measure it, and if yes, how much it would be. For this experiment, I took a Creative Sound Blaster Live sound card, which was very widely used in the end of 90s, beginning of 2000s. This sound card was even still not bad in 2005, and I was curious if it would do the job better than the onboard Realtek. Well, features-wise, definitely, but also in performance. This time, I also disabled the Realtek onboard sound chip in BIOS, to be sure that it doesn't make any conflicts. Do you remember what we got in Quake 2 before? This were about 218 FPS. And with Sound Blaster Live, I got now 253 FPS, which is around 15% faster. So if you ask me if you should use a dedicated sound card on a machine of that age, yes, definitely. As you see, it can make a noticeable difference. And this is it for me for today. I got another machine for playing and doing my experiments, and I hope you could take something with you as well. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. Just as always, please leave your feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, subscribe, share, and so on. And I say thank you and goodbye.